back to the lecture series in cell culture. So, last class where we ended, I talked to you about the, the phenotype of the myotube. So, while we talk about the phenotype of the myotube, we talked about that it has multiple nuclei aligned in a line and this tube has the inherent capability to contract. Sometime it is a spontaneous contraction, sometime it needs a neuronal signal. We will come later into the part 2 of it. But in the rats, it has been observed if you grow from the fetal rat, most of these uh, my tubes show a spontaneous contraction. Now, whenever a muscle contracts, there are two things which happens. There is a sliding filament motion of the actin myosin filament on top of each other. This is what contraction happens like this, okay, reverse direction motion. So, you can refer to any textbook in uh, animal physiology or you can go through some of the lecture series what I have given in there. You can really figure that out, it is fairly straightforward. But in order to negotiate that sliding filament, there is a need of a calcium spike. The calcium has to come into that milieu. It is something like when I drew in the last class, I will pick it up from here. So, this is uh, week 7 lecture 4. Okay. So, so there is a slide for the sliding filament to happen, what you will be observing is at a particular time, there will be a these dots are showing the calcium spike. So, there will be a calcium spiking and it is a very transient spike. It, is, it happens like this and falls like this, very, very transient spike. But then who controls that transient spike is a critical question. This transient spike is controlled by a organelle which is present in the myotubes. Now, I am adding complexity. Whenever you are trying to grow muscle, you have to kind of keep that in mind. Organelle which is present on the myotube which is called sarcoplasmic reticulum and sarcoplasmic reticulum is kind of a sponge. It you squeeze it, the calcium will come out and then it will pull it back. So, it is something like if this organelle is present out here, it will throw away the calcium and immediately it will pull it back. And the time window which is there for it to give the calcium out and pull it back is what determine the calcium spike. So, this negotiation of uh, calcium spike by sarcoplasmic reticulum is also essential that you retain in the cell culture dish. If you cannot, then it is you are not really making the right kind of myotubes or not fully full fledged phenotypic features you are unable to observe. Now, sarcoplasmic reticulum is a calcium deliverer, but it gets influenced or it gets activated by two kinds of receptor. If this is sarcoplasmic reticulum SR, then this is activated by two unique kind of sensors on its surface, which are calcium sensors and I am putting two different colors to indicate highlight it. The red one and the green one, what you see here, one is called rhinodyne receptor, the other one is called DHPR receptor. These are calcium channels. Okay. These stand for di 
H stands for hydro, P stands for pyridine, R stands for receptor. So, a sarcoplasmic reticulum essentially has two different sensors in the form of rhinodyne RYR in short it is also called RYR, RY stand for rhinodyne, R stand the third, second R stand for receptors. Then you have DHPR, dihydropyridine receptors, right. So, these two receptors, these two calcium sensors helps it to throw out calcium and pull it back. So, this is how the calcium dynamics works. So, this is in tandem with this spike what I have drawn, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, when you are developing an in vitro system, something like this. Now, here I have a myotube, right, series of myotubes which are growing. Here I have the multinucleated myotubes growing in a dish. Now, what is expected is, first of all, we talked about phenotype. Yes, you are lucky that you have a phenotype of a myotube, sure. Next step, you have a multi. Next step, what is expected in functionality is that it should contract, either by stimulation or without stimulation, contract or contraction, step 2. If it contracts, so in, in terms of the phenotype, not only the gross morphology, but the expression of expression of myosin heavy chain protein. Interestingly, while the muscle develops, so if you recollect when I showed you this picture, these myosins, say for example, I indicated myosin by blue, okay. So, these myosins change their form once they form the myotubes. There is a morphological or not morphological is the wrong word, there is a subtype expression. So, these are mostly much more mature forms of myosin, what you see in the myotubes as compared to the myosins which are there in the individual cells. So, this transformation from they call it fetal myosin heavy chain to neonatal myosin heavy chain, HC is heavy chain and then eventually adult myosin heavy chain, MHC stand for myosin heavy chain. So, these are the transformation which are happening. So, if you really are a successful, if you claim yourself to be a very successful group, at least you should be able to reach up to this point. You should have a neonatal myosin heavy chain expression, the transition from fetal myosin heavy chain to neonatal myosin heavy chain and it should happen in the cell culture dish. If it does not happen, it means this expression or in terms of the phenotype is not up to the mark. This is very important that you keep in mind that just making something would not work. Second thing, once the myosin heavy chain expression we have talked about, second thing in order of, of course, this is a physical parameter that you will be seeing contraction, but then this brings us to the third phenotypic difference which is are we expressing, of course, you have to locate for the sarcoplasmic reticulum that sarcoplasmic reticulum is well formed and that you can only prove by are we seeing rhinodyne receptor as well as DHPR receptors. These two are critical in this journey that these cells, these tissues should be able to express these particular and another important thing, these two 
unique marker DHPR and RYR should be in close proximity with each other, something like this, in a very, very close proximity. Almost it will look like that they are two, they are same entity, almost they are something like this, it should not be part otherwise this whole calcium spiking is not going to happen. So, how you do so? You have to have a specific anti antibodies against say DHPR and specific antibody against RYR. So, if you have the specific antibodies, then you can label them separately. So, when you are culturing skeletal muscle, you should have all these different parameters in mind that how I can you know say with conclusiveness or say with certainty that yes, I am observing all the features what is there in an mature tissue in vivo. If I do not have that, then I have to you know go back to the basics and figure out. So, what you need as a tool? You need antibody for fetal myosin heavy chain. At some point, you have to see that very early phase that there is an expression of fetal myosin heavy chain. Then you should have needed antibodies for neonatal myosin heavy chain you needed antibodies if you can have a prolonged culture for adult myosin heavy chain. You needed antibodies against DHPR and rhinodyne receptors and you should be able to see the physical contraction plus using electrophysiology techniques, you should be able to see the action potentials generated by the muscle cells, action potential by myotubes and next characterization what will be very important whether are you successful or not will be, you should be able to use confocal microscopy to visualize the calcium wave or the spike, wave is the wrong word here, I would say calcium spike, because it is possible that, highly possible and what people does, that you see a spike like this. So, at some point you will see a disturbance. So, if you have the right kind of, so when you have to do a calcium measurement, then you needed specific dyes which will bind to the calcium. So, now you can make a wish list that these are the things what I have to procure. If I had to kind of say with certainty my in vitro system works like this. So, this needs a lot of planning and a lot of most importantly needs a lot of groundwork and study. One has to literally study that you know this is what see it is it is not about whether I am successful or I am failed. What is important did I do the groundwork right? Did I look through every minute detail that you know this is what am I looking forward to? That is very critical that you go through that rigor of going through that whole paradigm that you know these are what is expected from me that these parameters are being taken into account. So, talking about a defined system for skeletal muscle, first thing one has to have a defined medium, first even earlier to that one have to know which age group you are collecting the tissue as I have already mentioned about the advantage and disadvantage of different ages. So, if you really pick up the tissue from say neonatal or post birth, you will have a lot of fibroblasts out there. So, they will outsmart your 
muscle cells because when you are pulling out this tissue. So, if you take a tissue from this zone or this zone, you will have lot of fibroblast and these fibroblasts divide very fast and if they divide very fast, then they will outsmart your skeletal muscle. So, you have to have a separation technique involved here by which you can separate the fibroblast. Once you separate the fibroblast, you may still have some contamination, but you cannot help it. You will still have because you really cannot separate out there are ways. So, one of the ways how fibroblasts could be separated out from muscle cell is you just put the tissues there, put the single cell suspension there, some of the cells settle down faster as compared to the other ones and mostly the fibroblasts settle down faster. So, if you know the fibroblasts have settled down, you can always take the suspension and remove it and that will have more of the muscle cells. So, there are some tricks which you go through the literature you will be able to figure out that is not a big deal. So, now depending on the age, your fibroblast contamination is going to increase. So, if you are taking something like E18, you have a very minimal amount of fibroblast contamination, but that has its advantage as well as disadvantage. Disadvantage is your growth will be slow because fibroblast helps secrete several supporting factors what the skeletal muscle needed. But if you can compensate for this factors using your cell culture medium, then you can reap a very profitable harvest from it. Okay. But that, that again demands that you understand the basic biology right. Okay. So, depending on the age group what you are picking up, you will have this fibroblast contamination. Once you override that by picking up the right age, Next is you needed to have a defined mediums. Why mediums? Because a part will be the dividing one. You remember I told you that you, you needed two, two phases of this. One will be this phase, which is this phase, second will be this phase. Dividing plus differentiation plus dif and only differentiation. Okay. Followed by you needed all these different parameters to be taken into account. The morphology, expression of the myosin heavy chain, the fetal myosin heavy chain, neonatal myosin heavy chain and if you go further, adult myosin heavy chain, presence of sarcoplasmic reticulum, rhinorhine receptor, DHPR receptors, the action potentials by the myotube and their contraction and followed by the calcium wave, measuring the calcium wave. So, now you realize that how intense the process of developing cell culture models are. It is not just throwing some cells and growing some cells. It is about systematically figuring out how close you are to the real life. So, I will close in here. Next class, we will explore further. Thank you.